Some time ago, I heard a compliment that was paid to somebody, um, and it, it really struck me. Uh, the person that received the compliment was a, he was a father and a husband, and someone looked at his wife and looked at his kids and said, your wife is so happy. And come to think of it, your kids, your kids are, are just so happy. And I thought, what? What a high compliment to be paid. Wouldn't I like to hear that? Wouldn't you, if you're a parent or a husband, like to hear your wife who looks to you for leadership and all sorts of things in your home is flourishing like a vine and is just happy that you are her husband. And your kids that look to you for all sorts of good things are just blossoming like happy children. Who doesn't want to be paid a compliment like that, right? And you can, be, you can extend that all the way to really anything that we lead or we have been given charge over in God's hand. If you are a manager in a department at work, uh, how would you like to just be flipping through Forbes one day and see, you know, this year's 100 happiest places to work and just start flipping through it casually and be surprised to find your company at number four on the list and your department listed as a place where people are happy and your name as the manager that makes these people so glad to be working for you. Man, who, who wouldn't want to receive that, right? Or you can extend that to anything. If you have a garden, you want happy, fruitful plants that are doing better because you're tending to them than they would be doing if you were not tending to them. Whatever God has set you over in your life, I bet you want to see those people or those things or whatever it is flourish and, and, and do well and be happy because you're taking care of them. Now, I say all that because this morning we're going to read a story where a far-off queen comes and visits King Solomon, who has been set king over all of Israel, and she pays that very compliment to him, and, and her heart is moved as she says it. How happy are your servants who bow to you, and how happy are the men who serve in your kingdom. How happy are the people that you lead? What a high compliment. And, and as we read that, there are several works that I'm praying the Lord will do in our hearts this morning, works that I think the Spirit longs to do in us this morning. One of them just being, how can we lead the stuff God puts us over in a way that leads to people saying that, well, your kids are really happy. Your whatever are really flourishing under your leadership. And at the same time, I think he's going to make us long to be part of a kingdom like that, to be led by a king like that. And so as the Lord works those, I pray he moves powerfully in us this morning. Let's look at 1 Kings 10, and we're going to read verses 1 through 10 this morning. Now the queen of Sheba had heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. And she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing that was hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba saw, when she had seen all the wisdom of Solomon the house that he had built, the, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, the attendants of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half of it was not told to me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report that I had heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel because he loved Israel forever. He has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. 
Never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. The words of the Lord. What we have in these words is, on one hand, a picture of what wise leadership can do. And on the other hand, a picture of the coming kingdom that Jesus Christ will build. Not only that, but a picture of the worship that we will offer him when we see him in his splendor and his glory. And so this morning, I pray that in some ways the Lord makes you even like King, of, the, like King Solomon of Israel, wise in all that he has set you over. And on the other hand, I pray he makes you like the Queen of Sheba, standing behold the king in all of his glory and offering him worship and praise. May he do that in you. May he do that in all of us this very morning. We're beginning this morning, you might call it a mini-series on the books of First and Second Kings, which we plan to follow along with our Bible reading plan. Now, if you're doing the Bible reading plan this year, you are probably in First Kings 4 or 5 today, depending on whether you've done your reading today. And you're going to be going through this, and we'll be speaking and talking, and we'll be talking about some of the same things that you are reading. And right now, you're toward the beginning of this story, and it's bright and wonderful and beautiful, but by the end... It's going to be very dark. Uh, the books of First and Second Kings tell the story of the fall of Israel, the slow unraveling of the kingdom. It begins with a golden kingdom under King Solomon, even the high point of the Old Testament, and describes Israel's descent all the way from her beautiful golden age down to the exile where she is deported from her homeland and the kingdom is in shambles. Now, if you're one of the original readers of this book, you're living in that period of exile and you're taken away from your homeland and back home the temple and the palace and the city are destroyed and everything's in shambles. Or maybe you've gotten to come back and you're trying to rebuild it, but it's all broken down and you're sad. You're going to be asking one question. If God made all these promises to us, how on earth did we get here, right? How did we get to a broken down temple and broken down walls in this mess that we are in? And First and Second Kings is written to answer that question for those people. How did we get here? What did that descent look like? We will go over the next two months or so and we will follow that story and learn how they got there. The story opens with Israel at her golden age, her peak, the mountaintop of the Old Testament under King Solomon. And the picture that it paints in these first six, 10 chapters is this, a, a beautiful golden kingdom that we all read about and say, I would like to live there with a dark storm cloud over it. They are under King Solomon. The kingdom is flourishing. It says the people ate and drank and were happy. The king was wise. He was executing justice. There is gold all over the place in the story. There are pillars of cedar, the temple is being built, everything is going wonderfully. But there's a cloud hanging overhead that says, this can't last forever. This wise king is engaging in idolatry. What's going on there? This ever wise king that's built this wonderful kingdom has 700 wives and 300 concubines on top of that? This ever-wise king seems to be growing more and more greedy throughout his reign. Wait a minute, where's this going to go? That's the opening scene. Beautiful kingdom with a storm cloud hanging over it. And what we will see is that over the generations, that storm cloud will turn into a hurricane and destroy the whole kingdom. That comes in future weeks. For now, we just look at the golden age. We just look at the fun stuff, the good stuff. And in this story, there are, as I said a moment ago, two characters who are set before us as examples. One, a wise king who rules what he, sets over, what's he, what he has set over wisely. And the other one, a foreigner who comes into the kingdom, sees this great king and offers him worship. And we will look this morning at the high point in the Old Testament, you might say, and ask ourselves, how does the Lord call us in one hand to be like Solomon? And has it call us, on the other hand, to be like the Queen of Sheba? 
Now, as we do that, it's going to look like this. First, we're going to do a lot of digging around in the Old Testament. We'll flip back all the way to Genesis. We'll look at some other stuff in 1 Kings that happens before this. And uh, it's going to be quite a dig. You know, you're, going to, you're going to have to track with me, pay attention. We'll go back and forth through all kinds of stuff. But when we are done with that dig, there are two very great jewels at the end of it that I believe will be worth it. So more than normal mornings, I'm going to ask you to track with me as we go through different places. Uh, keep your attention zoned in and I'll do my best to make everything as clear as I can. Uh, We start digging this morning with two great questions, two great longings that would be put on our hearts. Now, I said earlier that an original reader of this book, out in the exile or living in the broken kingdom, is going to read this, read of all the gold, read of all the prosperity, and they're going to be hit with some longings, right? How do I get back to that, right? They're going to read it and say, I I want to go there. I want to be there and not here. The Spirit works that in our hearts too, in two ways. One, how do I lead like Solomon in wisdom? And two, will there ever be another kingdom like this that I could live in? All right, our country's got some problems, doesn't it? Will there ever be a kingdom like that and a ruler like that that we can live under? We take those two longings And at the end, we're going to find answers in the Bible that satisfy those longings. First, we're going to go on a dig. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 1. If you're using a pew Bible, it's on page 1 of that pew Bible. And we're going to ask a question this morning. Some of you are very familiar with this story. Some of you may not have ever read it. Um, The short version of the story is that God makes everything in humanity, makes us wonderful, and we basically ruin it by sinning against God, by breaking his laws, and everything that is broken here today is there because of that. I want to ask the question, what would have happened if we had not sinned against God? How would the different story have gone in the alternate timeline where Adam crushes the snake and no one ever sins? What would humanity look like today if that had happened? There are some clues there, and we'll start at Genesis 1, chapter 26. God says here, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So there is God's intention for humanity. He made us in his image, which is an ancient way of saying, let me appoint them as my rulers underneath me. I will rule the heavens and I will rule all of the planets and the stars and space and everything and I will set them under my kingship over earth. They will rule earth. That's what it means to be in his image. And then he gives us dominion over all the earth, the birds, the fish, animals, everything here. Anything here on earth, he says, it's ours. We've got dominion over it. We're the kings of it. Then in verse 27, he does that very thing. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There we have clarity. This is not just true of men, men. This is men and women who have dominion over all of the earth. And then in verse 28, he blessed them. He says, be fruitful and multiply, which means make babies and let those babies make babies and many, many humans, seven billion so far from these two people. And then fill the earth, so don't stay in this garden I've put you in, but spread out, cover the whole earth, and subdue it. So if there are jewels in the ground, dig them up and make something cool out of them. If if you can figure out how to make dirt into an iPhone, do it. Turn the fields into, into, into farms and grow fruit and eat it, right? Have dominion, subdue it, and have dominion over everything that's in the earth, the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens. So we have there God's original design for humanity to multiply many of us. Not to stay in the garden. I wonder if you imagine this alternate reality being we all live in the Garden of Eden together in happiness, right? Nope, we spread out, we cover the earth. That was the original design. And then subdue and rule that earth. You might say to turn it into God's kingdom here on earth as his princes ruling under him. Now let's take that one step further. Okay. Adam and Eve have had a few generations of children. We are starting to feel a little cramped in this Garden of Eden, so we start spreading out and we fill the earth. What do we find? 
Well, Genesis 2 tells us that. Flip to Genesis 2. Let's look at verse 10. Here's what we would have found if we had ventured out of Eden. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided, and it became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havila. Okay, so we would have done what settlers do. We would have walked down this river, and then the first thing that branches off is the Pishon River. Okay, what would we have found in Havila? Where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. And delium and onyx stone are there. So what would have happened is we would have ventured out of Eden, and the very first place we would have found is this land of Havila, where there is gold, where there is delium, where there is onyx, where there is who knows what other precious stone and metal there. And with the charge from God to fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it, and multiply, what would we have done? We would have dug it all up and built ourselves a golden kingdom, right? A city, houses right there, maybe skyscrapers out of delium, if that's what delium does. I don't even know. Buildings out of gold, right? Because the gold of that land is good. So when we read of kingdoms like Solomon's, or if you watch the Marvel movies and you see Asgard on the screen, this golden, wonderful kingdom, or if you read the Lord of the Rings and you read about Rivendell, this wonderful place, and your heart just says, oh, I want to be there. Why does your heart say that? Well, because that was God's original design for humanity, to fill the earth and turn it into the golden, wonderful kingdom of God. That's why that kingdom's on your heart, because God put that longing in you, because you are a human being made in his image. Okay, we're tracking so far? That's the original plan, right? Kingdom of God, golden kingdom being built here on earth. God's people building his kingdom here on earth. Now, let's go back to 1 Kings. In those first chapters of 1 Kings, now you don't have to follow along in here with me, I'll just summarize it very quickly. Uh, We read of what would have happened under Adam's kingdom that never was, right? Now, what really happened in Adam's kingdom? A serpent came into the garden, deceived the beloved woman in in his life, that is his wife Eve, That deception spread to him, and then they both sinned against God, and everything was ruined, right? So all it would have taken to have that wonderful kingdom of God built here on earth was just, right, one stomp on a snake's head, and boom, the kingdom would be here, right? Well, when King Solomon rises to power, there are many snakes in the court, And the first thing that Solomon does is chase all the snakes out of the court. There's one left, and that one tries to deceive the beloved woman in his life. That is Bathsheba, his mother. Bathsheba is deceived, and she goes to Solomon with this plan that if Solomon falls for it, will bring down the whole kingdom, just like Adam and the serpent and Eve in the garden all over again, except this time Solomon catches on, right? And he says, wait, wait a minute, mother. If I do that, the whole kingdom will fall. And you know what he does? He puts the snake to death. Now, what if Adam had done that, right? He does what Adam should have done. He chases the serpents out and puts the worst of the serpent to death. Then he's given great wisdom And he builds a kingdom that sounds just like what King Adam would have built in his human race that would have gone out, a kingdom full of gold. It says the people ate and drank and were happy. The tables were full. There's gold everywhere. They're in safety. They're in security. There is wisdom under the king. Everything that Adam would have built, it seems, now King Solomon is building it. So Solomon's kingdom then, here's the point of all that, Solomon's kingdom is a picture of of Adam's kingdom that never was. It's a picture of that kingdom that humanity was supposed to be like. When you read about that prosperity, when you read about uh, 120 shields of gold that each weigh 12 pounds of gold, and you're like, oh, I want one of those, right? You're reading about what humanity was designed to be the whole time. That's what Solomon's kingdom does in our hearts. Points us to the kingdom that we were supposed to have built all along, what is on our heart. So I hope that leaves you with two longings. One, 
Can I get in on that wisdom and maybe build a little picture of God's kingdom and what God has set me over? You know, maybe the people in my department at work can be happy like this because I led them. Well, I'd love to do that, right? And that second longing, will there ever be a kingdom like this again? Will we ever get to build the kingdom of God here on earth? And will there ever be a king this wise again? That passage places those longings in our hearts because the scripture's answers to both is yes. And so what we look at here in this story are clues to how those longings can be satisfied. Okay, there was the dig. That was the archaeological digging up the jewels that we went on. Now we pull out the two jewels, we look them off, and I'll give you two points this morning. The first one answers the question, how did Solomon build the golden age? Right? How did he do that? And is there anything I can glean from that that would help me to lead better what God has set me over? Let's examine the story and ask that question first. First, we'll review what the Queen of Sheba saw. Look with me at verse 4 in chapter 10. The Queen of Sheba sees, it says, all the wisdom of Solomon. She sees his house, the food at his table, picture all this in your head, the seating of his officials, the attendance of the servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord. And also verse 8 says a little bit as well, She sees the servants and says, happy are your men, happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Okay, there's what she sees. How did Solomon build that? Well, there's a hint in verses one through three. She comes to test him, right? See that at the end of verse one? She comes to test him with hard questions. And then in verse two, She tells him all that's on her mind. That's at the end of verse 2. And look at verse 3. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was hidden from her. How did Solomon build this wonderful kingdom? He was wise. That's how he did it. It sounds like it's saying he knew everything. At the very least, you couldn't stump him. He was that wise. Uh, We read in other places of all the other things that he had studied here as a wise man. This is how he built that kingdom. The other thing he had going for him was that he clearly had God's favor, and we read of that in verses 8 and 9. She says, happy are your men, happy are your servants who stand before you, and then in 9, blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted you is delighted in you, so God favors him, and set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. So he's got two things going for him. God favors him, and he's really wise. Now, think about whatever it is you're trying to lead or whatever it is you're trying to tend and care for. If God favored you very high in it and you were really wise in how you led it, it would go pretty well, wouldn't it? That's a pretty good formula. So then we got to ask the question, okay, how did Solomon find God's favor and how did he become so wise? And that question is answered in chapter three. Flip back with me to chapter three. I told you we'd be doing a lot of flipping this morning. We won't read this whole story, but I just want you to see that it's really there. And you may see a heading in your Bible at chapter 3, something like Solomon prays for wisdom or Solomon's prayer for wisdom. This is a story where Solomon has been set on the throne and he is intimidated. And the Lord appears to him in a dream and says, basically like genie in a bottle style, ask for anything and I will give it to you. It's not three wishes, it's one wish, but you get anything you want, right? And Solomon answers... Well, you've made me king of Israel, and I don't even know my left from my right. I can't lead these people. And so if you're going to give me one thing, what I want is wisdom to lead your people well. And the Lord, rather than saying, you're right, you're not very smart. I regret putting you on the throne, right? That's not what the Lord says. He says, oh, Solomon, 
You asked for my favorite thing to give. I love wisdom, and I have so much of it, and I love giving it out to people. So because you asked for wisdom, I'm not just going to give you wisdom. I'm also going to give you everything else you might have asked for instead. Here is long life, and here is great riches, and here is victory over your enemies, and here is prosperity. You can have it all because I am so pleased that you asked for wisdom. So How did Solomon find God's favor, and how did he become so wise that this kingdom prospered? He asked God for wisdom. It was was that simple. And and that's the first jewel that we take this morning. It's the first jewel I just want to pull out and dust off for you. If you want to tend well what God has put you over, seek God's wisdom. It's difficult, but it's that simple. Seek God's wisdom. Now, a little bit of a caveat here. Someone may preach this one day and say, this is a guarantee to prosperity, right? You want to be rich, you want to be famous, just ask God for wisdom, you have whatever you want, right? And the world is just too broken for it to work that way, right? This is not a guarantee that you will have a great successful life if you seek God's wisdom. What it is, is more like when you ask your phone to give you directions somewhere, uh, you might say, hey, Siri, or hey, Google, right? Uh, help me get to Nashville, Indiana, and she'll give you a, a route to get to Nashville, Indiana. She's not giving you a guarantee that you're going to make it to Nashville, Indiana, right? You may run out of gas. She's not going to help you. you. Your car may break down. You may get in a wreck, right? Anything may happen, but she is going to give you the best path to get there. And that is what this text lays before you as well. If you're seeking for these things that you are leading to go well, there's no guarantee that they're going to go well, but here's the best path. Ask God for his wisdom. That's the way to get there. Seek his wisdom. There are then three ways that I can think of that we should seek God's wisdom. And they're all pretty well modeled by Solomon. The first, I already gave away, ask for it directly, right? Uh, The second would be search for it in God's word, especially Solomon's Proverbs. And the third would be to find people who are older than you and who are wise and holy and ask them for advice as much as they will put up with you asking them for advice, right? Three ways, ask God, seek it in his word, and ask wise people for advice. Let me me detail all three of those for you and what that looks like. The offer that God gave to Solomon, it was special, right? He appeared to him in a dream. You've probably never had a dream where God offered you anything in the world, but it does tell us about God's personality. It tells us about his character. And the book of James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives it generously and doesn't find fault. Uh, That means if you're a parent and you honest to God say, God, I don't know what I'm doing and I really need your wisdom. He will not say, you're right, I regret making you mom and dad over those kids. That's, That's not, he doesn't find fault in the asker. No, he just gives wisdom generously to all who ask for it. So if you're looking for wisdom, if you want a surefire source of wisdom, just look up to God and ask for it. Uh, I think it's wise to do this every day if God has set you over anything. It's a good prayer to ask God every single morning, would you give me wisdom to lead whatever it is God has set you over? I think it's a good habit also when you are stumped to say, God, I don't know what to do in this one. Will you help me? He doesn't always give magical answers to your questions, but he will give you wisdom more and more as you ask for it. So there's there's the first way. Ask God directly for his wisdom. Pray for it. Second way you can seek his wisdom is by looking for it in his word. You can find his wisdom on every page of the Bible. You can especially find wisdom in the Proverbs of Solomon himself, this very person who wrote a whole bunch of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. Uh, And there are many ways that you can seek their wisdom, just treat it like a gold mine and go on a dig and pull out everything that you can do. Uh, I'll give you one of them now. This is the one thing that I try to do every day, and it takes about 45 seconds, and I think it leads to more and more wisdom. I'm seeking it myself now because I need it to lead this church and lead my family. Very simply, I hope you have a time already in in the day when you read your Bible and pray. I hope you have a time dedicated to that. 
One very simple thing you can do, and I've mentioned this before, is at the end of that time, flip to the Proverbs, uh, just keep a bookmark there in those sections, you know, that have the little short ones, you know, there's that whole several chapters, nine through 23, that's all two line Proverbs, and just choose one a day to memorize. If you've got a bookmark there already, you flip to it, you pick one, you'll spend 30 to 45 seconds and you'll have it in your head. Then close your eyes, pray to God for wisdom and be done. You do that every day. Memorize a short proverb every day and just see how much the Lord slowly drips wisdom into your life. You can grow a plant with many, many drops of water, right? And the Lord can do that to you, dripping wisdom slowly to you if you commit to memorizing one proverb a day. Now, You won't get to where you can quote the whole book beginning to end, probably. Great if you do. I probably never will. But what will happen is you'll find yourself in situations like you'll be at a restaurant maybe and you'll see someone complaining to their waiter and you'll be like, I'm not sure that that person's being genuine in their complaint. And you'll say, hey, wait, there's there's a proverb about that. What is it? Uh, Bad, bad, says the buyer, but when he goes away, then he brags. Ah. That's what's going on there, yeah. You'll find times in your real life that the Proverbs are coming true and God will use it to give you wisdom as they come to mind. So that's my advice to you there. Uh, There are many ways you can search for wisdom in the Proverbs. That's a big one there, though. And third, seek the wisdom of people who are older than you, wiser than you, and have been holy for a long time. Uh, Young people, this is something in this church that you have that you would not have at many churches, and you need to avail yourself of it. Uh, There are in this room a few dozen people who are older than you who have been walking in wisdom for a long time. And if you will get to know all of the people in this church, you'll figure out who they are, who the ones are who speak with just a wise humility, and you can tell there's a seasoned holiness and wisdom in their voice. You need to make sure those people's numbers are, are in your phone. And, and when you are stumped, yeah, ask God for wisdom and then go through the phone book and pick one of them and call them and say, hey, I don't know what to do in this situation. What do I do? Uh, avail yourself of that. God gave them to you right here. There's no reason not to take advantage of that. So seek God's wisdom by asking for it directly, by searching his word for it, and by going to people who are older than you and wise and holy and seek their wisdom as well. This applies to you no matter what you are set over. I wonder what God has set you over. It's something. My five-year-old has been set over a, a set of dresser drawers, and, and we expect her to seek God's wisdom and care for it well. When you're five, that means listen to your mom, fold your clothes, and put them away, right? Don't, don't wreck it. That's what that means for a five-year-old. You may be set over more than a set of dresser drawers, but what is it? A, a home, a family, department at work, a soccer team? What has God put you over? Let me give you a minute to think of what it is. Whatever it is, this applies to that. If you want to hear people say, man, your soccer players are so happy. Your kids are so happy. Boy, blessed are the people that are led by somebody as wise as you. Well, no guarantee that you will get there, but the path to get there is to seek God's wisdom. Before we go on, let me just apply this to one environment. Uh, let, let me pick, I've talked a little bit about managing at work. Let's do that one. Let's say you've just been promoted to the boss of your department. You're probably intimidated, right? The guy that you sat next to in the cubicle, now you're his boss, and that's going to be awkward. And so you're thinking, well, what do I do? Well, you, you seek God's wisdom, right? You look to him and say, God, I've got to lead people that were my peers three days ago. I, I need your help. I need your wisdom. You search the Proverbs for business advice. There are good business principles in the Proverbs because God cares about business and buying and selling and making stuff. And there are people in our church even and other people in your life who have built up businesses over their lives. I can think of two men in our church who spent most of their life building up a business and recently sold it and are enjoying the fruits of their labor. 
I'm not going to tell you their names now, but if you ask me after church, I will. And you can call them and ask them for advice. There are all kinds of people like that. You can ask for advice in our church. See God's wisdom by asking for it, looking in his word for it, and looking for advice. And see if slowly God makes you wise enough to handle these challenges. And maybe if even he's so pleased you ask that he gives you his blessing. That's the first jewel this morning. You can lead what you tend well uh, if you seek God's wisdom. But there's another far deeper longing that this puts in us. When you see 120 shields of gold, and they're each 12 pounds, and when you see the people ate and drank and were happy, and when you see of their prosperity and victory over their enemies and their safety, I wonder if it does to you like it does to me, if it just makes you say, I want to go there. Like, can I live there and not ever have to vote in another election again, right? Oh, man, wouldn't that be nice? And the reason the Lord puts that desire for you is because there will be another king like this. And there will be another kingdom like this, right? The kingdom under Adam never was. The kingdom under Solomon fell. But Solomon's son, Jesus Christ, came born of his line, heir to the throne of Israel. And he began to preach And you know how Matthew describes his preaching in one sentence? He says, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Friends, that kingdom that never was and then was but fell, that kingdom is near in the coming of Jesus Christ. He would then minister for three years, he would die mocked as the king of the Jews in a purple robe and a crown of thorns. All of these things mocked to him. This is after he comes into Jerusalem and claims his place on the throne. But then he would rise from the dead and show that he was the valid king in the kingdom of God. He is the one that was made, or not made, but but given to rule all of the earth. The one that our hearts are longing for It's Jesus, and and then we read of his return. He will come back one day, sitting on a throne now in heaven, will come back, and when he comes back, he'll judge the earth and then build his kingdom here on earth. And you know what we read about in Revelation in that kingdom? All the same images, a full table, people being glad under him, gold everywhere, all kinds of precious stones and jewels, safety and security, victory over all of our enemies, everything we've ever longed for in Solomon's kingdom. Jesus says, I have it in abundance in the kingdom that I will build. And that means that one day, you will stand before Jesus Christ the way that the Queen of Sheba stood before Solomon. And here is what you'll say, maybe something like what you will say. The report was true, what I heard in my own land, of your words and your wisdom. But I didn't believe the report until I came, and now my eyes have seen it. And behold, the half of it was not told to me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report that I had heard. How happy are your men? How happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom? And blessed be the Lord God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne. We will say, I heard about you. My pastors told me about you, right? And I was slow even to believe it in my own land, but now I see it and behold, they didn't tell me the half of how great this is. How happy are these fiery servants of yours, these cherubim and these seraphim who wait upon you day and night. How happy are the men and the women who live and dwell here in your kingdom. I was not told the half of this. Blessed be our God and Father who put you on the throne. And then we will say, here, I I didn't plan to do this, but I brought all these riches with me and you can have all 
all of them because you are the king that I have always longed to serve under. Friends, the kingdom that you want will come in the name and the glory of Jesus Christ. He's the one. But remember his words. It wasn't just the kingdom of heaven is near. It was repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Right? Kings have laws, don't they? Kings expect to be obeyed. And when he comes, the first thing he will do is judge the earth. And Revelation paints the pictures. There is a lake of fire. We often call it hell. And it says that in there will be cast everyone who has lied and everyone who has stolen and everyone who has committed immorality with their bodies and many other crimes besides this. Kings expect to be obeyed and we who have not obeyed him cannot expect to be brought into his kingdom, can we? That is why he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, I hope your heart longs for that kingdom. If you want in, follow his words, turn, repent. His death that he died is more than enough to cover every sin, every crime you've ever committed. But to receive that, you must turn, you must repent, you must trust him instead of whatever you're trusting now. You must follow him instead of whatever you're following now. You must look to him in faith, and say, I turn from this. Will you forgive me? And so to any who need to hear it, I call you even now, if your heart longs for this kingdom, hear his words. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. All right, let's enter into a time of prayer of commitment. There may be some way that God has moved your heart to respond to this message. We'll pray together. I'll give you a chance to respond to God in that way. Let's pray.